again, thank you for joining us for another episode of Hot Topics as we continue with our new series, New Justice. And today we're going to be continuing with the conversation on cancel culture. Those of you who saw the previous episode would remember that we spoke about cancel culture. Is it good? Is it bad? We wrestled with it, but there is still a question we have not explored, or rather a topic we have not explored, and that is the impact of cancel culture on those who have been canceled or what it also means for those who do the cancelling. And so today we're going to continue with that conversation. A couple of things we want to wrestle with is what does it mean to be a convers- or to be a community that brings people in in a context where people are cancelled for their mistakes? What does it mean to be a community that lives as Jesus called us to? We recall in one particular parable, the parable of the forgiving servant, we recall this story about a servant who does not forgive another person after he had been forgiven. And then it ends up with this particular servant being thrown into prison because he clearly did not understand the idea of forgiveness. And so what does that mean in a community where we've been forgiven for our sins and yet we cancel people? And then the question therefore lies, where do we draw the line? When do we cancel someone and when do we bring them in? And so to explore the conversation today, we've brought back Barry and we've got Sims. We are also joined in by someone exciting, Tylo. It is not better to hear from a Gen Z's mouth what cancel culture actually means for them. Else, any thoughts before we kick it in? Thanks, Lenny. Yeah, I think just to, to tap on last week's conversation, it was really great to to hear how different perspectives are presented. And one of the things that I really drew from the previous conversation was how complex this issue of, com- uh, of cancel culture actually is and how often we... Um, try to define it, but by defining it, we're only looking at one aspect of it. And and so just to bear that in mind for this conversation that with such a complicated topic, there is such a vast array of implications for different people. I think you've touched on that, especially with that those that are cancelling and those that are cancelled, the implications for both aspects will be completely different. And, and, you know, to not simply think that it's either positive or negative, to, but explore the range of implications that cancel culture really does have on our society in the digital space. Absolutely. And so to kick it off, Barry, Tyler, Sims. So something I've been thinking about just um, recently is um, after we had our conversation is, how do we uphold call out culture? Because we can never deny the fact that it's, there's a place for it in society. But how do we uphold it in a way that does not make it difficult for us to carry it, to carry it out consistently? The reason I'm asking this is cancel culture as how society sometimes views it, and that is us just canceling people and throwing them out forever, can never be something I apply on my own dad or a family member. What happens when a family member says something that I strongly do not believe in, I do not agree with, and believe perpetuates injustice? Um, What happens when that happens? You know, how do I make sure that in as much as I call them out, I do not cancel them out eternally? Or should we be doing that to our family members? Over to you. How would you deal with that? Sure. Anyone can go for it. Yeah, it's an interesting one uh, because um, because we wanna we wanna be able to hold everyone accountable, and what 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 cancel, cancel culture at least in, in in the context that we're talking about cancel culture is the digital space yeah. is that it makes people so it, it makes people it, it makes lynching so easy because you're doing it from the comfort of your home. Uh, it's yeah. easy to point a, a finger at a point of comfort. It's easy to point a finger when no one is actually really looking at you or no one is really going to follow up on you pointing that finger. You know, it's easy to start a fire in the dark as opposed to starting it in the light where everyone can see you. So, and yeah, and I hear you because um, we need to keep that level of consistency, uh, at least uh, of calling out people who are even uh, in our family. As like, for, for instance, we know that like a lot of men, um, basically brush aside the way we treat women, especially in our families and in our inner circles and with people that we're very close with. You know, we like Mm -hmm. to just disregard um, the men are trash uh, movement or at least the whole thing around it, you know. And I think, yeah, I think, I I mean, I don't know if, I I do agree, like we do need to find a way to 
have open conversations with um, our family members, our friends, our inner circles. And I think the church can also like, you know, really help us because especially for me, who's like the last born in my family, it's hard for me to, you know, hold my parents or my elders accountable. It would be easier for me to be like, go to my minister and be like, yo, I think there's some foul play coming from one of my elders and I don't know how to approach it. Um, I think this will make it very easy. I think I, th this is what makes this conversation so interesting in this space because we're talking about it from a church context um, and not just from a broad context. So yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I mean, I just wanted to add on to that really. I didn't, I, I didn't really wanna, but I think it's interesting because it's, it's such a hard thing to do in application, especially when it's close to home. Yeah. Thank you, Sims, you know, and maybe just to hear from Tyler and Barry, you know, it's really just one of those, you've got a family member, they stand up at a braai or at a gathering and they say something you do not agree with that makes you cringe, you know, how do we apply cancel slash call out culture in that context? Because, you know, you can never cancel out someone that you have a, you know, that you have a, it's not easy to cancel out someone that you yeah. share a relationship with at such a level, yeah. you know. Um, I think, I really don't know. Um, I'm someone that was raised in a respectful home and, um, the only place I really had room if, if I disagreed with someone was outside of the family circle, but that didn't really stop me. I still felt the need to in, enforce what I felt, regardless of possibly what the people in my family felt. Um, as as at a situ so sometimes my family says really offensive things and i don't think they realize how offensive it actually is and um i would never turn my back on my family because of the love and respect and family forgives one another you know we um we that's just what you do um but i think it's a constant reinforcement of that opinion continuously um and sometimes the people, sometimes people just don't listen um, or want to hear you because they know their own opinion. Um, but in general, I don't think, I think it's such a complex thing because it's your family, you know, it's all you know. And um, social media and technology and sitting behind a screen has given so many people a powerful voice and such a powerful, such an influential um sort of facade um, to achieve whatever they want without facing personal um, implications of it, without them realizing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's different. Like you said, when you said all of a sudden, can't, I'd never be able to do that to my dad. I was like, oh my word, that's literally what it is. Like, it's supposed to be that simple. Um, and I just don't think people understand that. Sure. Yeah, if I could comment there, you know, um, I think what we've highlighted in, in both what Sims and Tyler have said is that um, things have changed so dramatically because we're working off what I refer to it's, and we identified in the early 2000s as the third screen. We knew that the third screen was going to have an incredible um, impact. We, in those days, we were even worried when we were looking at youth about the second screen, which would be the screen in your own bedroom. But today you carry that screen in your in your pocket. So I just want to take a bit of a step back as a means of just um, giving some context to why uh, our behavior has changed in the way that you guys are talking about. I think, you know, as early as, um, uh, as history is that there's always been the opportunity for people, we can see it in the Bible too, is to cancel somebody. I mean, Jesus was canceled, if you really want to put it that way. Um, uh, but besides um, that, there's, if we just take it from um, the time that possibly um, you guys were born, the, the sort of the, um, the mid-80s through to um, maybe 2000 or so, uh, what's happened in that period is we've gone from what we used to refer to as um, character assassinations in the media, where we had small groups or communities of practice that would um, name somebody for something they'd done within their community. Uh, that sort of progressed to where even once we started using computers and the, there was a, a broader voice and mail wasn't at a snail pace. Um, it was actually across digital media. We started talking about shaming people. 
And then from shaming people, we went into the cancel culture. Now, the big difference here is that it started off from credible, informed opinion leaders who used to shame to where we have now is that anybody with a voice can say anything, whether you're credible or not. What gives you the credibility is the volume. And that volume very often is driven by an activist. And I was interested to see that uh, Road Marshall of the City Press actually defined cancel culture uh, as a form of activism, and a activism aimed at those who claim some form of privilege. And it's a love, I love his, um, uh, his uh, definition. And the reason is because whatever privilege we claim, whether that's uh, a, a privilege to be um, of a specific gender or the, the male privilege, for instance, or white privilege, or even positional privilege, as we see in, uh, in politics, in each of those aspects, we'll always find this sort of cancel culture. Where I think we as a church need to stand is to be very, very clear on the difference between the cancel culture and the call-out culture. And, and it comes down to language, because if we call everything the cancel culture, then we actually, if we would, on the negative side, we're saying that the call-out culture is bad. And it's not. The call-out culture is very good, as we indicated last, last week. And I mean, Norpi gave us a very good example of how important it is to have that voice when you feel that you're frustrated, you're getting nowhere. And I think the, 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 the cancel culture is something that we really have to embrace because what it does is it does change the person or the group that actually is perpetrating whatever the injustice is. Whereas cancel culture looks only at cancelling the idea. So I'm going to use an example, and just forgive me if it's a bit long, but I think it's a very, very important one, and it's something that we've been tracking since the beginning of last year. I was fortunate last year to be travelling through the Eastern Cape when it was around about um, a, a late March last year, and I heard this uh, on the news that um, uh, Donald Trump had mentioned something about hydrochloroquine. And now everybody came down on him, this hydrochloroquine. You know, he's such a fool and what have you. What's happened is that they've cancelled, by means of social media, Donald Trump and anything he said. Yes, he was maybe not a particularly bright president. But the fact is, is that it doesn't matter who his character is. The fact was that he was cancelled. So something like hydrochloroquine, when he mentioned it, was immediately poo-pooed as rubbish. We're now finding... And that's one of the implications of the cancel culture, is that now we're finding in the press, and understand, sorry, I've got our pharmaceutical background, so I understand that uh, what, what epidemiology is about. And one of the issues is, is that hydrochloroquine and um, uh, ivermectin are, are products that can be used in the home for many, many people to be able to overcome the, um, the, the or, sorry, as a prophylactic measure in the instance of um, the COVID-19. So the thing is now, now they're actually counting the cost of lives lost in America because they poo-pooed the whole issue of hydrochloroquine. Vaccines only work once you've got, um, uh, uh, once you've got the virus um, in place. The, um, the spread of this disease could actually have been stopped, as we found in India, as we found in Zimbabwe in the last eight months, that they've managed to control the, the incidence of hospitalization as a result of it. Now, that's a long explanation of an example to say that when you cancel somebody, you cancel everything they say. Whereas... I think you Sorry. Sorry go for it. No, no, no. I was just wanting to make that point. We have to be, but calling them out is a different story. We're now calling out those people to say, you know, it's not only the vaccine that could have helped people. So sorry, Ilza, continue. Mm. No, I'm very, I think what's, what's been raised are some really helpful ideas to think about it. And the language issue is definitely a big one. I know, you know, Sims was speaking about this idea of 
um, people hiding behind a screen. And for, you know, just personally, I've found that very often when people are behind a screen, they're a lot more liberal with the word choice than they would be if they were speaking to someone. You know, and as Christians, one of the things that we call to is God, our tongues. And we know that there's power of life and death in our tongues. But somehow from our brains to our mouths, we may, may manage to find ways to control our tongues, but from our brains to our fingertips, we sometimes don't seem to be able to control what we want to say. You know, and, and I think there's value in the call out culture and, the, and, and, and being able to speak up about issues. I think one of the things that this um, technology and digital platform offers to us is this ability to no longer turn a blind eye to mm -hmm. power, because if you're not going to call it out, if it's bad enough, somebody else is going to call it out. Yes. And that's that's helpful. But, you know, what what you've raised, especially Barry and, and Tyler as well, is we need to kind of walk with people in grace as well. We can't completely cancel them out just for the sake of one bad idea. Um, something that comes to mind for me a couple of years ago was a Miss South Africa candidate whose whole career was derailed because of something that was said a couple of years ago on a social media platform. And yes, it's important to, to bring those issues to light, but her whole career has been sidelined. Sideline. Her whole potential as a human being to add value to life, to um, charity events, to everything that the Missile Africa title presents an opportunity to has now been cancelled. And I can't really see that that, you know, that behavior can be ju fully justified. You know, it's, it's one of those complex things where it's, it's good and bad. And so I was wondering, is, um, what are some of the instances where we as Christians could engage this culture and, and, and allow it to be used for good while using it in a way that truly exemplifies what we stand for as Christians? And that is people that walk both with grace and with truth. I think it starts with language. We have to we have to move away from uh, what not what I refer to, but what has the social media referred to as a woke language, because woke language uses very very short statements to make very very powerful loaded um, uh, meanings that have very often have loaded meanings. So I think that we as a you know for instance uh, the the word that this this movement of what is man flesh or whatever it's called is I mean um, yeah it's okay for for identifying something but to throw it around as if everybody is like that is is not the role of the church that's the role of social media you know we have to be more sensitive in the language we use I think that's where it starts mm. is that we mustn't become part of that language we can understand it we need to understand where it comes from. But I don't think that we need to. We we must we must perpetrate that. We we as a church talk about the language of hope. And let me give you an, an idea, uh, an, an example. The difference the difference in the way that um, Black Lives Matter, um, which is a statement, which is uh, considered woke in 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 many circles, as opposed to the as opposed to the new movement in America now, which is. Uh, um, Asian lives matter, but they don't talk about it in terms of Asian lives matter. They say, why don't you love us as much as you love our food? Or as they've, um, as the Me Too movement, the Me Too movement was about, I'm supporting you. Just that hashtag tells you a lot about the way that they use their language. It's about, we support you. So I think using, uh, um, uh, adopting hashtags, we have to be careful about what it says about us. And I think that's the point that I'm making. Starts there. It's, it's, it's Barry, but the thing is, you know, what I struggle with, you know, um, and also to your point, Ilse, what I struggle with is, is the church in the business of, how can I, so is the, is, is the church in the business of creating completely new concepts and completely new language or is the church in the business of actually going into the context of that language and um, finding hope in those ashes that that language might portray yeah. an example is in response to black lives matter what, um, richard draw writes a very beautiful meditation 
and he says, what would it feel like to be offended and out of your offense, go stand in those, you know, uh, obviously, uh, uh, go stand in the middle of these protests and hear what those whispers are. I think of a song that was written um, during the apartheid era, for instance. Um, don't know if you remember the song. And I, I, I was thinking about it this week in light of the, uh, the recent lootings. The, the, the song, um, um, I forgot what the actual name is, but it's the one that Weeping goes, it doesn't me. matter. What's that? Weeping Song. Yes, Weeping the Weeping Song. song. Um, and it is written by a young man who was uh, going in for military conscription, serving his time. And at the time, the context was that they were being recruited against the black danger, Swat Khafar. And when he gets there, what he then writes is that we were sent to protect the country from a lion. I mean, from this roar, from this creature that was roaring. But when I listened in the night, I realized that it was not roaring, but it was actually weeping. And you find that even with the looters, it's the same thing. And even though Black Lives Matter to us might sound like a roar, but when we sit in the middle of that protest and we listen, it's actually a weep more than it is a roar. The same applies for men are trash. You know, how much that statement offends me, as opposed to how much I've come to offend, my presence offends women. You know, women cannot trust me. It doesn't matter whether it's Khoni um, or whether it's Sims, but when a woman comes across a male at 9 p.m. at night and they are walking home, she does not feel safe. And so my question is, shouldn't the church be sitting in the middle of that protest? Shouldn't the church be part of that hashtag, listening to that hashtag, so that we can find, we can hear that weep, and we can be on the side of those who are mourning. Blessed are those who are mourned, for they will, you know, for they will be called child, uh, children of God. Yeah. We can hear those who are mourning, and from that place, not from a place of correcting, but from that place, say this is the way forward now that we are on the side of those who are mourning. Yeah. I actually wanted to say, uh, sorry, sorry, can I just respond to that? Sure, sure, sure. I'm not saying don't, don't. I'm not saying don't throw out the language. I'm saying for me as a as a as a member of a church, I want to hear the weeping. I don't want to hear the Black Lives Matter thing. That's already there. I mean, it's around me. It's around the world. But me as a church, I want to hear that weeping. So I'm going to look at that and I'm going to say, wow, this is absolutely ghastly. You know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily, I acknowledge Black Lives Matter, but I acknowledge the weeping that comes from it. Yes. That's where I'm saying as a church. So for me, it's not about talking about Black Lives Matter. It's about the church saying, I hear your weeping, I hear your pain. So I'm not saying let's throw out the language. I'm saying... Because we can't. We can't change the language. We can't change the culture out there. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is we can hear and we can react. And that's where I'm saying, uh, we, that's my point of view. So it, it, I think we hear it. We, we're talking the same language. I'm just saying that I don't want to perpetrate something in terms of a language that labels us. I would rather be labeled as somebody who hears the weeping rather than for those who don't know what a church is, looking at us and saying, oh, well, you're part of that political movement. Mm. Well, that's Barry, all I'm that, saying. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Um, I think, you know, if I'm listening to everything that you're saying, a lot of it is saying, like, with this thing of cancel culture is a tendency of humanity um, to take things at face value, especially with the digital um the digital space is we take things as they are we don't necessarily hear the weeping we simply hear that roar and and something that i wanted to mention earlier sims before i give you a chance to respond because i'd love to hear what you wanted to share mm -hmm. is um how with the with cancel culture and the digital space is so often because and and i was to to Clooney's question as well about would you call out a a um, parent or a grandparent or someone like that is when we call out in person, we're given an opportunity to bring to light the story behind the story and and not to defend or to justify, but to understand, to hear the weeping. And and whereas with council culture in the digital space, so often we have to take things at face value. We're not able to hear the story behind the story. We're not able to hear somebody's perspective or their reasoning for doing something the way they did or what they said. 
and we also don't give people an opportunity to show their personal growth because what somebody said two years ago on their social media platform might not be the way that they feel anymore but because it was placed on a platform surely that's not how you feel you know that's you and that's it you're only one dimensional sims i'd love to hear what you wanted to share just now no i just wanted to add on to like what cloney was saying um I, I I do think that I do think the church at times plays a a too passive of a role when it comes to situations like cancel culture or situations where emotions are high and you know the language is is distorted and things are not going the way they should. I think I think I think for me like it would be cool if there was like um like a very more um. Um, proactive role that the church uh, took and a very more because I find like the way to educate people is it's better to come from a, a point of empathy and that's why I like what like uh, Sony said like it, 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 it's it's very important to um, it's hard to to be a person who's been offended and then put yourself in the mix of what the other people are actually saying it actually takes you to be very um, mature about things it actually t- takes you to have a very like um, emotional intelligence about you and the thing is usually in such situations it's such a charge it's such an emotionally charged situation and it's hard like for people to to think or for people to you know just sit back and be like yo what's really going on here how do we tackle this issue you know and I feel I find like the church there needs to be needs to be that person. I think the, the church needs to rep- represent what Jesus represented and was that put yourself in the situations of both these people and what is really going on. And I'm like, yo, I hear what you're saying and I hear what you're saying. And I think we can, you know, be better about this. You know, I think like if we get too bogged down with like language and like the um, the surface stuff that we won't get to, to the real meat. But I look, I understand like the concept of the church being a hospital, but I also need like the church to be um mediator really like like engage like these kind of situations and then after engaging really educate um you know the people and how we can you know better these things i'm not going to say it's going to be easy because again it's emotionally charged and anything can go anywhere but i think if this church has a like a really strong stance on what it is the solution might be or at least a better way to let these two parties engage uh, in their problems, then maybe we could get a, a different outcome, you know, because it was so easy. And sorry, it's only like what you were saying. It was so easy for people to be like, these people are looting. These people are looting. But like, yo, these people are hungry. Like, you don't understand. Like, that is an actual real thing. And we just want to cancel. And we just want to fight back. But like, we don't want to understand. And, 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 and to credit, like, at least the greater South Africa, like, we picked that up real quickly. Like, yo, actually, no, this is actually hunger. This is not just people looting, yeah. you know. And, and I think that was, for me, I thought that was very progressive because the looting could have gone for weeks and months and yet, it, you know, it stopped because then it was, oh, this is actually the real problem. Zuma is not actually the problem. Yeah. So true, you know, but maybe just something I want to throw out there for everyone, you know, it's so, so would we say that the reason call out culture sometimes goes wrong is because we have not created a society where people know how to speak about issues, where people people genuinely know how to engage, you know. Um, where when I see a particular, so for instance, you know, I go back to this guy who wrote the weeping song, that the guy lived in a context of propaganda. You know, this was like yeah. some hectic propaganda in those days. You know, oh, the what's idea. The song? Of, what's that? The song. What is the song? Like it's weeping song. It's, it's, I knew a man who lived in Oh, got you, got you. Yeah. Okay, you know it, okay. Sims, you know it. Yes, I do, sure. I do. And I just explained why I'm not, in, 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 in a very short chorus, I just explained why I'm not in the worship team. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> no problem, but, bro, no problem. You know, um, but, but, but my thing is, he lived in a context of propaganda. You know, this was like serious propaganda. Yeah. And... He went there to protect his country, you know, South Africa, the state. But there's something special about him that he was able to actually break through all of that and actually hear that, no, 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 this is actually a weep and not a roar. Now, I want to get to a point that have we maybe not brought up society 
in a way that we don't know how to engage issues. You know, I've heard people complain, for instance, I'll make an example, you know, complain about um, platforms such as the TRC and say the TRC was meant to be longer. We were meant to unpack stuff and take some lessons, you know, but it was really just a very quick process that helped us just turn the page. You know, um, have we not created a country where people just want to turn the page and they do not know how to engage each other and therefore then the language is very violent and it, this is translated onto cancel, as, uh, into cancel culture on social media because even in person we never knew how to engage each other. Instead now all of this stuff that bothers me when I'm at work when I get onto my laptop I just type it quickly and then it's just this outpouring this outburst yeah. whereas had we had an honest conversation and we learned how to engage one another we maybe would have seen a new a different culture even on social media you know so would you say maybe what we're seeing on the screen is reflective of what's already happening in society and not necessarily a new phenomena um I think I, I think I kind of want to answer on that because I made a few points in regards to how people react via social media. Um, you know, Clonia, I think when I am sitting face to face with you, right? Um, say now you and I have had a falling out and we're going to meet up for coffee and I'm going to attempt to try and speak this through. I'm horrible at conflict, can't stand it. I fall apart at the midst of it. But um, just as an example, um, before we meet up, I am going to have a few conversations in my mind of what I want to say and how it's going to go out. Right, which I'm sure all of us do. Um, but people on social media, everyone has been given a voice. Everyone's an activist now, you know? Um, and that's where it is. People are reacting from a place of impulsivity based off rage of what they've just read or just seen instead of the process that takes place once you are able to sit in an emotionally stable place and not focus on all the rage that is in front of you and the issue in front of you. Um, and obviously that's where like the, the, the violent language and all these... these um, really brutal stuff starts taking place. And I also think um, the lack, via social media and via text, you struggle to understand um, someone's paralinguistic features. So that's your, um, your, body, your body language, your verbal cues, your tone and all that stuff. You, you don't receive that. It's not receptive over text, um, over social media. And people feel the need to get their tone across through brutal words they have no idea the implications and the effect that the, the effects it's going to have on someone because they're trying to portray their emotions um as emotively as possible via a platform that strips you of your human interactions and the humanity of it and and the vulnerability of it um in regards to that song the only way he was really able to understand is when he was sitting in it, not sitting away from it. Um, and what people on social media have is we are sitting in it, but comfortably, until it's you. You know, we are sitting raging about something, um, maybe because we're passionate about it, maybe because of it happened to someone we know or, or um, it happened to you. But there comes a place of emotional processing um, and critical thinking where you no longer, once you experience a trauma, once you know someone that has experienced a trauma, if you act impulsively, you will go and hash that person's name on social media. But when it's really happened to you, you sit in it first. Um, and I think... There's so many people nowadays that don't want to acknowledge that sometimes people make mistakes. Um, sometimes mistakes aren't condonable. We're all human, you know? Um, and that's where the Christian aspect comes into it. You're going to have to sit and think, okay, listen, I have sinned on multiple occasions. I've probably disappointed God in multitudes, you know? But 
what happens if he cancelled me? Um, what happens if he didn't call me out? Which God actually does. He calls you up to, through um, condemnation and um, your unsettled soul. But how can we do the same as his hands and feet, as his vessels, without causing intense damage? You know, how can, how can we do that without partaking in the rage? Um, and that's not what a lot of people know. Um, cause I used to be like that before I am um, really encounter God. I'd hop on the blasting of anyone I knew, um, without even firstly acknowledging factual stuff. I'd probably only get through the first paragraph and be like, okay, this is post worthy. Um, and bring light to a situation I didn't have full facts on. Um, and not really sit down and think, okay, what what is the real thing behind this? What is the root? What is the stem? What is the pain? Um, which I think as people we don't do. We we are very quick to, just as a whole race of like people, <laughs> we are very quick to act from our place of emotional pain, anger, joy, instead of allowing that to subside and look at it from a logical perspective. Um, I know I'm, I'm, I do that all the time. Um, and I think once that happens, once we can detach from the rage, detach from all of that and look at it and think of the reason, you know, like a reasonable way to move forward, to move through it in a way that is um, progressive and active instead of reactive, um, things will start to look up. And the, the idea of cancelling the whole person will, be, will begin to subside and the idea of calling out will start taking place. Mm. Thanks, Tyler. I think you've just given us a lot to think about and just so many aspects of what you've you've shared. And thank you for your honesty and your vulnerability. You know, um, just kind of presents a different way. As Christians, we're presented to, um, or we're in the world as alternatives to the rest of the world. And you've just presented that. One of the things that I've personally struggled with with the idea of council culture is the lack of reformative um, justice. You know, people cry that this is justice, this is justice. But often with council culture, there's a lack of reformative justice because mm. people are entirely cancelled and they are not given any way of kind of digging themselves out the hole or nobody is there to, to, to help them rebuild their lives. Yes, yeah. we have to call things out when there's problems. I'm not saying we should keep quiet, but... In, in a sense, cancel culture on the digital space, and we I'm just going to keep bringing it back to the digital space because that's the topic of our conversation. Yeah. It doesn't enable people to be able to say, right, I messed up, um, I made mistakes, how can I now fix it? Because so often, um, they, their lives, their careers, their, their finances, you know, are even affected. Um, I, I recently, in, in researching for this, I, I read about an author that entirely she was about to um to to publish a three book series and because of one sentence in one of the books um the whole series was cancelled and they didn't publish it until that was corrected uh, and you know you think about the economic impact of something like that on an author yeah. uh, um, and just the the way that cancel culture at, at times can rid people of or rid the world of people's valuable perspectives um because they are you know, dis different from from what society wants. Um, Sims and Barry, I'd love to hear your thoughts um, on on Tony's question. Well, um, I I just like to uh, comment on Tylo's input. I mean, she said exactly what. Um, I, I've got a heading that I wrote down uh, in preparation today, and I mean, you've you've said it so beautifully, Tyler. I'm just going to read it because it's um it's it's from a book I read. It says, too often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the comfort of grace and forgiveness. Yeah. And I think that really says what you said, Tyler. And I think that, that at the end of the day is, is what, what I believe. Um, the I do believe there's positives in the call-out culture, but I do believe that on the other extreme, the cancel culture just takes us to a different place that we shouldn't be going. Mm. Yeah, I guess like um, I think, and I and I agree with you. Elsa. I think the problem is like 
um, it's like because it's such a digital space, it's not regulated. Like we 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 don't have like a, we don't we don't have limits. You know, I mean, for me personally, like I have a lot of issues with like law and how it works, um, just in the context of what it's done to like my people as in like black people. Yeah. Um, like it's never necessarily have been for. Um, like the poor people or people who are just like um, not necessarily in a position of wealth or riches or whatever. But um, but what I do like about the law is it tries to learn from its mistakes and it, it has a way to regulate itself. It's not a perfect system, but it's a, it's a system that is constantly trying to improve. As opposed to cancel culture, <laughs> you know, there's no... There is, it's, it's what we're saying. It, it goes to the extreme. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also like my biggest issue with it is that it has no, it has no point of, you know, allowing the people back into society. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you go to prison, like there's, there's actual programs that actually can help you better yourself as a human being. Um, there's actual things like prison is not a, just being locked away. Like it, it actually helps. There's things that can put, there's things that are put in place to, to better yourself when you come out as opposed to cancer culture and this is what we were talking about last time is, and this is what i guess what, what we're trying to do is like talk about the victims of of this cancer culture from both sides but i guess like the ones who are being cancelled it's like but what do we do once we've cancelled them because yeah. you know um like with family and friends if someone has done me wrong sure i will reprimand them and tell them like yo you've done me wrong but there is a way to come back and learn from that um, and, and also for me to learn from that. It's also a question, like, I don't know how to, like, answer, you know. It's so weird because, like, when Tyler was speaking, I was like, yo, I actually looked at some of my Facebook com uh, Facebook uh, posts that I posted up in, like, 2007, 2006, which yeah. is, like, just <laughs> after the trick, bro. And, like, when I it read them, I cringe. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? What was I saying? You know, because, like... Um, you know, because like I know that I'm a better person now, and I know that like that was a little bit misinformed, that was a, mis a little bit misguided, even though it was like, it was like fluff. You know, it wasn't as as deep as what cancer culture is looking for. You know, but like, I I understand that I can I can definitely be better than that, and I can learn from that. It's just like, how do we tell the whole digital space that yo people can be better? You know, like we can actually forgive people, and find ways for them to actually be better, you know. Now, a good example of that, Sims, is um, you're probably aware of, uh, is it uh, Mwumo Jubjub, the guy that uh, killed those four children yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. 2010. I mean, you know, he was cancelled quite seriously by the social media, but, I mean, what you've said there is that people do have the opportunity to improve themselves. If you look at where they are, where he is today, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, he's the guy that actually runs this um, program, uh, Uya, what, Uya Jola 99, uh, which is on television. So, yeah. so in fact, the, you know, there is what's nice to see is that despite cancel culture, they, cancel culture is transient. So, you know, although you might have been canceled, some people are lucky enough to come out the other end, uh, but it doesn't happen with everybody. So I think, you know, there's, there's examples. I mean, I think the other person is it Palesa Letlaka who, who um, used the opportunity of social media to call out um, um, the paternal, uh, not paternal, the, um, the, the male dominance of um, her culture uh, and has, has used that as, a, as an avenue. And I think once again, we see the value of the call out culture, somebody who's, who's actually calling out the problem as opposed yeah. to the person. And I think we're going to see a lot more when we start calling out the problem, we can then start seeing the people who are perpetrating that. So in a way, I think Sims last year, last uh, week, you, you mentioned the fact that there's a place for cancel culture too. I think when cancel culture and call out culture combine, uh, I think it's a very, very powerful tool. So I'm not saying the one is worse or better than the other. I'm just saying that as a church, I think we, if we recognize both as a means of change uh, and we use uh, the opportunities that they present uh, to us, as you said, Shloni, I think we're, we're in a strong place as a church. Hear the yeah, weeping. 
you know just to add on on Barry what he's saying is it, it's and it's, and it's it's so cool that we spoke about this last week is um is that like the internet space is still a fairly new space to us mm. as human beings you know like i do feel like the generation after us will definitely know how to navigate this space way better than what we are we're just like yo first time in a candy store we're going crazy you know no regulation no nothing you know and and i feel like with a couple of years things will get better i guess i just answered my own question with just like this hope that i have in my mind because i don't think what we will i don't think we will um like conquer our problems with the internet like right now i think it, it's it's something that um like just our next generation will have to figure out and i'm i'm actually hopeful in that in that sense i love that sims um thank you so much sims barry tylo i really think those were um bars um <laughs> as in like those were really solid and i think that was very helpful input you know um i really yeah. like the point around the credibility of people you know i find that so many people have an opinion on social media around stuff and you just follow some of the content you you cringe you know when um it is a topic of interest that you've um researched and you are really informed from both a pr uh, practical you know and a theoretic uh point of view um, you know, and then, um, so I love the fact that you mentioned that, Barry. I love the fact that, Tyler, you mentioned just around, you know, looking at the content that we upload. Um, and I think, Sims, you also then spoke about, you know, just also looking at the content, you know, um, stuff that we used to upload, we would no longer upload now. And I think just also around the church, I think then the importance that, um, the importance of learning how to rehumanize you know, those social media profile pictures we are engaging and remembering that these are human beings, you know, um, I think that is very important. And I think the role of the church, maybe then just to say, just to answer, you know, one of the things I'm really beginning to discern as the role of the church in the digital space is not necessarily to set the tone of the digital space and how people engage. You know, I think that borders on problematic past church um, practices where we try to um, dictate to people that this is how you do ABC, but rather we are meant to disciple people to use all these beautiful yeah. things that are on social media as a means of um, continuing God's commission. You know, I think Barry, you said it. How do we use um, cancel culture and call out culture, you know, for the kingdom and not necessarily, you know, so. If we do not disciple people for that, they're going to go, as Sim said, they're going to go wild like kids in a candy store. You know, so I think our responsibility then is to disciple people. And that will be very helpful. Else, I don't know if there's anything else before we pass down, pass on to everyone for closing remarks. No, all good on my side. Thanks, Lenny. I've just really enjoyed this conversation. I think a lot of um, helpful things have been highlighted. And, and just what you what you said about humanizing and just to acknowledge that a lot of things are more complex and um, people are very complex and and how nuanced some of these things are instead of simply a a, a one-dimensional picture yeah. um that's been really helpful for me personally in this conversation so barry sims tyler we'd love to hear from you guys as we close oh i've got nothing to say i'm good <laughs> yeah like uh, i've said everything I, I needed to say but thanks you know this conversation is, is needed and you know, thanks for the platform uh, to share these things because um, it's it's one thing for us to speak, but I think like I'm also educating myself as I'm hearing from um, you guys as well. So shout out for this, really appreciate it. Mm. Oh, um, <laughs> I think one thing I'd like to say is for everyone that needs that wants to react, that wants to um, have that voice. Um, sometimes in those incredibly intense situations people will your weeping will be louder than your violent anger that's all but thank you this was great I think there's been so much insight here yeah, my, my last thought once again goes both to um, uh, just uh, mirroring or reflecting on what Tylo and uh, Sims have said is that uh, at the end of the day it's all about understanding uh, the context from which people speak and if we lose that um, we're going to lose one another. I think for me 
uh, just going through the last two weeks, if I can just clearly um, distinguish between what I consider to be the call-out culture. The call-out culture is really a, um, a, to me, it's a positive thing. It's a, it's a, it brings people to accountability. It, it, it needs bravery and it needs courage. On the other hand, you have the call-out, uh, sorry, the, the cancel culture. And I don't believe that takes a hell of a lot of courage. That just takes a lot of anger and peer pressure. And I think as a result of that, it's more of a shout out. And it has, as a result of that, it closes dialogue. You know, and when you close dialogue, you don't get the context of other people. And that's why I say, we as a church need to sit, as I say, we need to understand cancel culture, take what we can from that, open dialogue, and then the call out culture becomes meaningful. Either Other than that, just, do the call out, open dialogue, and let's let's go there. But we can't close di dialogue merely by cancelling. That's what I say. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Barry Sims and Ty Lowe. And Thank just to close me. off, I want to close off by quoting a um, a statement that was made by one of the, or rather, yeah, one of the founders of the Methodist movement, which later became a church, and that is called the Fifth Rule of a Helper by John Wesley. He says, believe evil of no one unless you see it done. Take heed how you credit it. Put the best construction on everything. You know the judge is always supposed to be on the prisoner's side. Emphasis, you know the judge is always supposed to be on the prisoner's side. And so thank you so much. We look forward to hearing from everyone. Give us your comments. Give us your reaction. Let us know what you think. We'd also love to hear from you. I think as Barry said, we want to open dialogue more than anything else because after all, this is our church and by our, even you who is listening on the other end are included. And so we want to create an exciting culture where we can engage difficult conversation without the fear of being cancelled out. Do take care and thank you so much. Thank you.